Beautiful. Thank you, Drew. Meditation on Eventide. What a beautiful hymn that is. Well, welcome to all those that are joining us online. We're glad to have you with us today. And for those that are here uh, with us in uh, the service, we're glad that you've taken time out of your schedule to be with us. Always good to see families. Well, you made it? Did it was successful? Successful. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> right. Amen. Bo, you're going to be able to eat for a whole year? Okay, I'm just checking. All right. Amen. Good to have you back. We missed you last week. I was thinking about you all week, praying for you. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Did you? Okay. <laughs> Uh, some of those mountains are like straight up, so, yeah, amen. Uh, not friendly, yeah, 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 well, it is good to have you back in one piece, amen. Um, and good to have everyone else with us this morning. Uh, we have a different service today, sometimes because of uh, the licensing on live stream. Uh, we have to do the choir before the service starts, so if you walk in, it's not that you're late, it's that we're early. Okay, uh, but we do that so that we can still allow the choir to sing the songs that we love, but also uh, make sure that we're within the licensing parameters that we have here at church. You know, back in the day, people wrote songs just because they wanted the Christian family to be able to sing it. Now everything's connected to financial uh, money, and as a result of that, everybody's interested in copyright, and uh, you know. One of these days, we're not going to be able to sing a sneeze unless we have a copyright for it, license. But um, uh, we're working with that, and we're trying to change some of the things that we do in service to, to make sure that we are compliant. And especially now that we broadcast live, I have a lot of people that watch us and, and uh, some that are watching us because they enjoy the service and others watching us to make sure that they can get us if we do something wrong. And so we want to make sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's correctly. And uh, so if you come in in the middle of choir singing, uh, you're not late. All right, we're early. Um, and so today's service is a little bit different based upon uh, this uh, change. And... Um, we have a special presentation today that we're going to get to here in just a minute. But before we do, uh, we mentioned before we went live some very serious needs in our church family. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray today that you'd be with us as we meet corporately. You have instructed us in your word to weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. And we certainly have had plenty of opportunity to rejoice uh, with uh, Roy and Linda here. What a great answer to prayer. A constant reminder to us that our God hears and that, Lord, many times you give us the desire of our hearts. But also there's the absence of folks that are not here today. Um, and our prayers went for them as well. But we have always prayed, uh, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And that doesn't make it easier when our will is not realized. It just makes it understandable. And Lord, we pray for Pat today. Oh, I know her heart is breaking. And not only is her heart breaking, but there is a shock of suddenness and surprise connected to it. And so Lord, we just offer our prayers on her behalf and for Terry's family right now. Oh Lord, I pray that you'd be with her. And for Terry, I cannot imagine how low and empty her heart must be. The loss of her sister-in-law and her mother in the same week. Uh, Lord, such devastation. And just to see her today is such an encouragement to me personally. To see that in the midst of that loss and sorrow, uh, she has come to the place that has offered her hope and comfort and companionship. Lord, I pray that you'd be with her and her needs today. And surround her with your love to let her know that um, in everything we're to give thanks and that all things work together to, for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We may not understand. Pat may not understand. Many of the circumstances we go through, we do not understand why you did it that way instead of our way. But in the end, we always know your way is best. So help us, Lord, in our loss and in our devastation, 
to run to the only one who offers us hope and comfort in times of trouble, and that's you. Lord bless, I pray today, may our hearts be lifted because of you, not because of the change in our circumstances, but because our focus is on you. Bless every aspect of this service, our sorrow. I don't want it to eclipse the joy and the things that you have prepared and planned for us today. But Lord, we don't ever want to negate uh, the sorrow of weeping with them that weep. Lord bless, I pray, our service today, those who have joined us online, and may your name be lifted up. In Jesus' name, amen. And now the Board of Christian Ed would like to recognize. Okay, I'm... Is, am I on? Okay, I'm Glenda Stangle. I'm the chairman of the Board of Christian Ed. And this is Beth. She was chairman. Anyway, there's a lady in our congregation. We tried and tried to get information from her. And it's like pulling a bear tooth. But we figured out well, asking her questions and everything. She's been teaching for at least maybe 50 years. And maybe 55, she says. But um, we definitely know 50 because my my children, she taught my children in Sunday school. She taught Anna Nagel. When, and Anna said she was, she taught her. And uh, we figured out oh, probably about 50, 55 years, so... We would like to have Mary Lane Steenrod come down. She doesn't know about this. <laughs> because if we told her, she would not show up. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. She has many hats. She has done many things for this church. But her biggest hat was teaching Sunday school from ages some oh, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sometimes teenagers. I don't know. We couldn't get any answers from her. So, uh, we all love her and because of all what you have done the board of Christian Ed would like you to present that little gift to you but you have to open it now um, Beth will take care of the paper <laughs> here This is a teacher plants a seed that never stops growing. And that, can't, that goes in here somewhere. It must have fell out. Okay. And the other one says, teachers change the world one child at a time. And she has changed many lives. Many lives. <laughs> That's, congratulations. And I'm sorry you retired. We did get a replacement at the last note. And um, um, Jan Fishball has taken her class over. So you need to be here for 50 years. <laughs> All right. Can we give her an applause to Mary Lane? Thank you, Mary Lane, retiring after 50 plus years from teaching Sunday school. What a blessing. Titus was in her class. Where's Titus? Where are you? Usually I hear you all the time. Oh, there you are. And she, we, as a family, we pray every night for the kids to go to bed. And Mary Lane, for the last five months, Every night, Titus said, and please let Mary Lane not stop teaching. <laughs> so you made an impact in his life and on so many more. 
and um, the gift that you got can't even touch the surface of what you gave. But we appreciate you. And, you know, every once in a while you read about these people who contributed like Mary Lane in a city or in a, in a state or in a nation. But we were privileged to have someone like that serve here in our congregation. And praise the Lord for that. And we appreciate you very much. Well, in this adjusted service, now that you've gotten all comfortable, how about if I ask you to stand? Would that be all right? If you like the hymn book, use the hymn book. If not, it will be on the overhead. But 449, 449, one verse only, must Jesus bear the cross alone? That's the question. And then there's the second verse, or the second line, that answers the question. Let's sing together. seated. Thank you very much. So that you understand that song, nobody wants you to carve out a piece of wood, throw it over your shoulder, and march down the road, okay? And we're not to look at the things in our life as some burden that we have to bear. But the cross of Jesus Christ that he bore was for others. And the song is about that. Should we live our life for ourselves? Or should we live our lives for others? If we're not careful, that message will get confused itself. Because then we'll start thinking that when we care for others, digging them a well, giving them food, or giving them luggage, lodging, that we have fulfilled the great commission given to us in the Bible. And that's not true either. The devil would be happy for us to be religious and not effective. But people that have full tummies without Jesus Christ die and go to hell. And people that are no longer thirsty and well drank or drunk in water, without Jesus, still die and go to hell. So if our only mission is to serve others and to give to others and consider others, and we don't tell them about Jesus, we've done them no service at all. And the Christian church has morphed into doing that. Where we think because we provide goods and services for the underprivileged that we are giving them the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we serve others the best and the way God wanted us to serve when we tell them about Jesus. Now if we use as a bridge to provide for them water and provide for them food and provide for them lodging so that they have an open ear to hear the truth of the gospel, then God is praised. But if all we do is serve their material, physical needs and don't tell them about Jesus, we have done them a disservice, not a service at all. So must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. And that is... I have the, the opportunity. Sharon's back here nodding her head. I'm with you. 
I have the opportunity to take of my material possessions and help people and in that tell them about Jesus Christ so that they can go free. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. It's not this, oh, I have to do this. Not that. Oh, the burden is so heavy. Not that. Not chiseling out a big old wooden cross and carrying it through the town so everybody knows how spiritual I am. That's not it at all. Brother Dave, it's about telling someone about Jesus. So, the work of Jesus bearing that cross is not just Him. It's collectively us as a church bearing that cross so the world can hear. I only say all that because there is this huge tidal wave tsunami blanketing the Christian church today. Teaching us that if we give people water and we give people food and we give people lodging, we're doing the ministry of Jesus. And that is a half-truth. That is not the whole truth. I remind you again, people fully clothed, fully fed, and fully drunk that die without Jesus Christ still go to fully hell. We never ever want to lose track of what's important. Jesus should not bear the cross alone. I get the joy of telling. And if you've never had the joy of sitting down across from someone or next to someone and telling them how Jesus died for their sins and that he died that they might know Jesus and be free and go to heaven and watch them get it. I mean, really get it. Thomas, I mean, they sit there and yet their eyes just, they click. Their whole body language. So I, I understand it. You say, would you like to pray right now and ask Jesus to come in your heart? And they go, yeah. And they bow their head. And you're sitting right next to them. <laughs> and they, they pass from darkness, spiritual darkness, to spiritual light right in front of you. If you've never had that, then you've never ever really experienced the joy that Christ has for you. The joy for Jesus was not dragging that cross or taking that beating or being nailed to that cross. It was in his last two words, three words. It is finished. Redemption was made possible because of what he did. And we have this great opportunity today not to let Jesus bear the cross alone, but to join with him. Sitting at the coffee shop, walking past the cashier. Lord, do you ever run the cashier there or do you just do all the big stuff in the back? Do you run the... Has anybody ever got given you a gospel track while you've stood there? A few of them have. I mean, it... Did you tell him, get out of your face, you don't want to see him? No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't imagine her saying that to anybody. Dave, never mind. Okay, so, but that's the joy. Wherever we go, we don't have Jesus on Sunday only, but we take him everywhere we go, hoping that we have this opportunity to tell them that they can be set free. Now, I'm going to be done with this, but I just want... I mentioned to you some time ago that I got a call from New York and I didn't answer the call because they were probably going to sell me windows and I wasn't interested. But when someone came through back channels to tell me that it was someone that knew me that was trying to get a hold of me, I answered the next time and it was Alec Drummond from New York many, many years after I first met him and I met him on the job and I asked him if he died, if he knew for sure where he'd spend eternity. And that bugged him. Two weeks later, he asked me how he could know for sure. And I walked him through the Romans road in the Bible. 
And he asked Jesus to come in his heart and save me. Save him. Thirty some years later, I got a call from New York saying, I just want to let you know, I really appreciate you sharing Jesus with me so I could know him as my Savior. I led my wife to the Lord and we have two adult boys. I led them to the Lord and they have each of them three children and their moms and dad led them to the Lord. And I just wanted to reach back to Tay. Thank you. So that all of us can have that story by just going out of our comfort zone and not allowing Jesus to bear the cross alone. And I encourage you to do that. I don't want this to be a down, depressing time. I want it to be an exciting time. All right, we get to do this. You know how Paul wrote it? I said I was going to be done, but I'm on a roll. You know how Paul said it? He said, we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. You know what the earthen vessel is? my body. We have this treasure. What's the treasure? Gold, silver? No. The ministry of reconciliation. We've got the joy of telling someone about Jesus. The treasure in an earthen vessel. We get to share it with everybody else. I encourage you today to share that. I've had a few times where people said, what I said, has anybody ever said, Lori, to you, uh, do you want Jesus? And you said back to them, I don't want any of that. I've had that happen once or twice, but a whole lot more. It has been people who have said, I don't. I don't know. Gary, who was 100% Catholic, I walked into his home and he had all these crucifixes on the wall and I said, Gary, I didn't know you were so religious. He swelled up like someone stuck 180 pounds of air in him. And he said, I'm Catholic. I said, oh, are you a saved one or a lost one? And 40 minutes later, he was still stuck on that question. I was trying to talk to him about financial planning, and he wasn't paying a bit of attention to anything I said. And 40 minutes into the conversation, how does someone know? Brother, you talk about an open door. So I took him down the Romans road and I showed him how he could know Jesus' Savior. And Gary asked Jesus in his house at the breakfast bar, asked Jesus to come in his heart and save him. Gary called me up about a year later and he said, Hey, I've got a missionary from Africa that's visiting uh, my church and I think he's one of the lost Catholics too. Can you talk to him? And I said, well, I don't know that he'll talk to me. Oh, yeah, he'll talk to you. And I met his friend who was a Catholic missionary to Africa and had the privilege of all places at the beer barrel in St. Mary's. <laughs> I had the privilege of seeing him bow his head at that round table and ask Jesus to come in his heart. Three months later, Gary said... Uh, I wonder if you'd talk to my priest. I think he's one of the lost ones too. <laughs> I said, I don't think he'll talk to me. Oh yeah, I give a lot of money. And uh, lo and behold, guess where we met? The beer burial in St. Mary's. And he was not at all receptive. <laughs> not, not in the least, amen. But I'm just saying, you would be surprised if you just, just step out of that comfort zone. Your knees will knock like mine do every time and you will feel like the biggest idiot in the world just like I do every time. But if you step out of your comfort zone, am I right, Dave? And you say, let me tell you about someone who changed my life and mean it. You'd be surprised the trouble that is out there masked in the appearance of self-control and self-confidence that really is weak need looking for someone to tell them the truth. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Now there's a cross for me to bear. There's a cross for me. And I hope that you'll take that challenge today. These songs are not just fillers in a service, but they carry a message to provoke us 
to do good. And I love telling those stories. The, the, the story is not about John Young. The story is about Jesus Christ. Because He changes people's lives. He changed mine. And He'll change yours. Well, we're going to dismiss the kids to junior church. All right? Bo, you show them how to get out of here, okay? Go like this. And you don't have to wave at me. That's okay. <laughs> Amen. Oh, looky here. Are you going to junior church? Okay. See you later. So, you know, Brooke, with the announcement from last week, Brennan and I did talk about that. We're going to try to tag team nursery. So uh, uh, this will be real exciting. She preaches every other week. I do nursery every other week. Now I'm going to really be upset that everybody comes when she's up here and I'm in the nursery and nobody comes when I'm up here. I won't take it personal, okay? Amen. I'm just kidding. So the songs in our hymn book are more than just words. And, and if you've not connected to them in some way, I'm trying. Can you tell I'm trying to connect you to them? So that they are more than just words. And this next song that we sing, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. It's page 405 if you like to use the hymnal. Uh, the reason I like to use the hymnal personally is because if you know anything of what I'm getting ready to say, You'll understand. If you do not, you will have no clue what I just said. The music is in the hymnal. And it's four parts. Soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Someone said, it looks like a bunch of people trying to get through a picket fence to me. Um, but what it is, is it's, it's notes on a page. And it gives us the opportunity to sing a part. How many of you have ever sung a part before? Okay, how I many of you don't know what I said and just raising your hand because you like to stretch? No, okay, <laughs> Bruce, uh, amen. Well, the parts are there. And what, you know, God designed the music. I mean, not he didn't design this song, but he designed how music goes together. Drew could do a much better job than I could ever do on this. But the blending of the notes and the fullness of the blending of those notes just makes the words pop off the page of our hymn book. And if you're able to learn, or if you know a part, opening the book, unless you just know the song by heart and you know the part by heart, opening the book allows you to see that. And basses, you know, that's usually men, they're deep, <clears throat> deep voices, okay. And then you've got the tenors that have that higher pitch and then the sopranos and those altos i know jones and alto and others in here altos beautiful beautiful when you blend them all together we see the blend of those voices together and then you put the words to them it's just amazing next week lord willing if i can get the permission to do so i want to let you hear a family just in their living room singing it's a family of about 40 <laughs> singing the haven of rest. And you hear all four parts. And if you don't shout, it's because your shouter's broke. Okay? I mean, it is something to hear. Lord willing, if I can get permission, we'll play that next week. But stand with me, if you would, one more time. 405, my faith has found ice or creed. I trust the ever-living one his wounds for me shall plead. You know why this was written? Because a lot of people say, are you a Christian? I go to the Baptist church. Well, that's nice, but that's not the question. The question, are, are you a Christian? Well, I can, I can recite uh, uh, this creed or this, this. Uh, that's really great, but that's not why I said, do you know Jesus is your Savior? Well, my mom and my dad were both members of that church. Well, that's great too, but that's not really the question. See, that's this song. My faith has found 
a resting place, not in device or creed. And he goes on, I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me to plead. And it is as if someone's trying to talk him out of that assurance. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and it's always personal. The gospel's always personal, and that he died for me. What a song. Man, let's sing it together. I'm so excited, I can't understand it. All right, let's sing it as a testimony of our faith who has found a resting place in Jesus. be seated. Thank you very much. I hope over a period of a year that you will get a better understanding of these great hymns that are in our book. I love some of the new uh, songs that are coming out. They have such great messages to them. I really enjoy that. But I don't ever want to lose sight of the great strength in living the Christian life that are found in the story and the backstory of these great hymns. Thank you, Drew, for always accommodating us. I appreciate that. Don't you appreciate Drew? What a blessing to have her there and play those songs for us. And she has such feeling as she plays. Our, our focus today is, um, of all places, in Colossians. We've been there for a while, but I invite you to turn back there with me. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And don't be afraid to use the index in your Bible. There's nothing shameful at all about that. Um, we use the index in almost any piece of literature that we use um, to find something. So don't feel bad about uh, seeking the index. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And... Um, Last week, we ended up looking at verses uh, 4 through 8. And as we begin verse 9, it's really hard to do that without going back to the last of verse 8, the context to see who we're talking about. So on the overhead, I took the liberty to include the last part of verse 8. If you have your Bibles open, and I always love to hear the pages of the Bible turn, uh, you will want to start with us in the last four words of verse 8. Notice what it says there, and we do this so you can see who it's talking about. And not after Christ. Now verse 9. For in Him, who's the Him? Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power how many of you know what the word trinity means or have ever heard the word trinity when it comes to christian theology trinity we speak of the trinity as god the father god the son and god the holy spirit almost everybody that's been around christianity for a while knows the term trinity it may surprise you, though, that the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It's a descriptive word. It's not a Bible word. And if you ever wondered what the equation, what's equated with the word Trinity in the Bible, it's found in verse number 9. And that is the word Godhead. Where we say Trinity, the Bible says Godhead. 
And the reason it describes it that way is it's one God and three personages. The Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with the sermon today. I just thought I'd add that, all right? Uh, nobody said I couldn't. So, but again, we often hear terminology in the Christian faith that we think are Bible words, but they're not. They're not bad words. They're just descriptive words. I always like to try to find in the Bible where the Bible word description is, all right? And the Bible describes the Trinity, that blessed Trinity, with the word Godhead. And it says here, for in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. A lot in that, and we're going to look at it in a minute. Um, Paul was a prisoner. I just want to remind you of this. Paul was a prisoner in Rome when he was informed of the false teaching invading the church of Colossae. Um, this is not in your notes, but let me just share. Every Wednesday, Pastor George Ganade calls me. At a set time, for those that don't know, Pastor George was the pastor here for 20 years before me, and we were good friends. And he calls me every Wednesday. And we have a good time. It started with him making sure that I was treating you right. And now it's morphed into this iron sharpening iron conversation where we both provoke each other to goodness. And he always gets the inside scoop from me so that he knows how you're all doing. Amen. And when I told him, Thomas, you and your family and Brooke and Matt, you and your family were coming, he was just beside himself with words. He said, really? And uh, so he's, you're such an encouragement even when you don't know that you are to others. He is just beside himself, I think. And Pastor George, you have to really know him to know if he ever gets excited because he doesn't show it as much on the outside. With me, it's pretty obvious. But we talk every Wednesday, and the reason, one of the reasons he started that is because he did not want false teaching coming to his sheep, his flock. You know, um, most pastors wouldn't take too kindly to that, but I was so encouraged. I like someone that doesn't do it for a job. They do it because they love. Some of you are nodding your head because you know him. And you know he loves you. Amen. And he wanted to make sure whoever followed him didn't lead you down the wrong path. Now, he still checks on me every once in a while, but <laughs> we have a good time in fellowship together. So Paul's in this prison cell. And he can't be at Colossae. But he's heard some things. And it devastated him. And with this disappointment, he took it upon himself to write a letter. And the letter is what we have in our Bible called the book of Colossians. That's his letter. In chapter 2 of this letter, Paul exposes the heart of the problem, denounces the false teachers... And then warns believers not to be, he used this word, spoiled. If any of you have a refrigerator um, and have ever opened the refrigerator on Sunday mornings or found it open on Sunday mornings, <laughs> yep, <laughs> then you understand the word spoiled. I was sharing with them. You'll have to get that how it was. How many quarts of milk? <sighs> That even hurts just thinking about it. Expressed milk for the baby stored in the refrigerator and the door is open. All spoiled. And the meat. A lot of the meat. Uh, I had a neighbor across the street. They were from Texas, so we just nicknamed him Texas Dave. Uh, Texas Dave had a, one of those huge, huge chest freezers in his garage and filled with bought meat. And something happened to the freezer. Of course, the lid's closed. So he didn't know. And a week and a half later, when it started permeating through the walls of the garage into the living room, you get the idea? That's what Paul said, spoiled. All right? That's the word he used. Isn't that a good word? 
I like that word. I, I have no doubt what that is. Because <laughs> if you've ever been upon something spoiled, then you understand it. And so what he did is he took chapter 2 in this book and he warns believers not to be spoiled by man-made philosophies. And to protect oneself against falling prey to such deceptive lies. And remember last week, we ended the sermon last week with that horrific uh, Jonestown massacre. 780 white-collar, mostly, workers deceived, drank the Kool-Aid, and died. So they're very deceptive. So to protect oneself against doing that, Paul encouraged the Colossi Christians to mature in their faith. Which included, if you'll walk back through me over the past few sermons, in verse 6, walking in Christ. He reminds us in verse 6 that we're saved by faith, so we should walk by faith. We are saved by the Word of God, so we should walk by the Word of God. We were saved by the work of of the Holy Spirit, and so we should walk in the Spirit. The Christian life continues as it began, and that is by faith, not by works or merit. I am not going to heaven because I'm a pastor. Trust me. I'm not going to heaven because <coughs> I own my own business. I'm going to heaven because as every sinner must do, I humbled myself at the foot of Jesus' cross, acknowledged He did everything for me, and I owe my life to Him. And by faith, I trusted His words. Who said, He that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. Doesn't matter what your background is. <coughs> doesn't matter where you've come from. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. He that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. Jesus never rejects anybody. He always accepts you. When I came to Jesus, I had a baggage behind me filled with filth. And Jesus never one time looked at that filth. He looked at me and he said, come, I'll accept you and receive you. So first of all, <clears throat> if we're going to escape <clears throat> this deceptive lie of false belief and false teaching, we must walk in Him by faith, believe what the Bible says. Secondly, in verse 7 of Colossians chapter 2, we're to grow up in Him. We need to develop a root system into the richness of God's Word, the Bible. I know I say this often. I will never stop saying it. That our hope of moving to maturity always involves this book. You would never hire an electrician to come to your house that didn't know what the book of electricity said. Or you would have a bad house when you flushed the toilet, all the lights would come on. No, we want someone that's well-versed in electricity to do that work because we want trust them. And in every walk of life, we do the same thing. We find, if I want to lay carpet in my house, I don't call a plumber. And if I want my plumbing changed, I don't call a carpet layer. Bruce said he's open. He likes to kick carpet, stretch it. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, did it for years. Now he can't hardly walk. Amen. So... But that we want someone that knows what they're talking about. And if you and I are going to mature in our faith to stand against the lies that are so deceptive, then we need to read this book. It might not be the top on your list. You might be surprised if you tried it. In the bulletin, every week we, we pr print Bible reading for that week, by the day, short segments so that you can learn the truth of God's Word. And in a year, you go through the Bible. All the way through. Generations to revolutions, as they say down in Kentucky. Uh, the whole book. Okay. 
And I encourage you to do that. You say, that's not on the top of my list. Oh, well, maybe it should be. If you and I are going to escape the deceptive false teaching today, it's going to be because we grow up in Him. And the way we do that is to read God's Word. And then in verse 8, Paul goes on, he said, following after Him. Walk in Him, grow up in Him, and then follow after Him. One of the easiest ways to make sure we're following Him in our learning is to ask this question. Does what I'm listening to, does what I'm reading, does what I'm studying give Christ the preeminence? You know what preeminence is? First place. And if not, then you stop reading that. Almost every religious system today gives Christ an eminent place, a high position, but very few other than biblically correct Christian material gives him the preeminent place, number one. Jesus was a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. Jesus was a priest, but he's more than a priest. Jesus will be a king, but he's more than a king. He is God manifest in the flesh. Preeminent. No one higher, no one greater, no one above him. He is first. In the passage that we've read this morning, Paul adds to these three steps of walking, growing, and following. He adds to that maturity by drawing on or living in the fullness that we have in Him. This fullness is mentioned in the text that we read today, verse 9 and 10, living in His fullness. And it gives us two specific things that describe the fullness or drawing from the fullness or living in the fullness of God. And those are, in short, some of you wish that was all there was to the message today, the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. Now, let's look at them briefly today. The supremacy of Christ in verse number 9. Notice what it says in verse number 9 again. We're going to read it. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just think about that. In Jesus is everything there is about God. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. What a statement. Now, let me just say to you today, the theological truth that sets us apart from everyone else is not our view of worship. It is not (laughs) our view of spiritual gifts. It is not what we think music should be or should not be sung in the worship. All these things are important. But the theological truth that sets us apart from everyone else is none of these things. What sets us apart theologically from everyone else is how we view Jesus Christ. The scriptures are very clear on the subject. And so if someone does not have the same view of Christ that we have, that means they've rejected God's word. Because God's word's very clear on who Jesus is. I want you to get two passages with me in your Bible. They're on the overhead too, but I love to hear the pages of the Bible turn. John chapter 1, and if it helps, John chapter 1, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And we're going to look at two verses, and both of them are in chapter 1. So, you know, it makes it pretty easy. The first verse we're going to look at is John chapter 1 and verse 1. I can remember as a little little kid um, growing up and hearing my mom, she was like she was practicing for a play, a part in a play. I was just a little kid. I didn't know anything. She just kept going over and over and over these words, and I could tell they were the same words. It wasn't until I was much older in life I realized that she was going to a ladies' Bible study and they were memorizing John chapter (laughs) 1. 
And so what I'd heard was not the words of a play that she was trying to recite, but she was trying to quote John chapter 1. And then after the Bible study was over, some of you ladies, you're going to identify with this. She was still quoting John chapter 1 after the Bible study because she found it so fulfilling personally that when someone's phone rings in a business meeting, we charge them $50. Uh Uh-oh, my phone just rang. You guys don't have that rule? I mean, I'm in good shape, amen. I apologize for that. Um, But she would quote that verse afterwards because it so delighted her soul. She quoted the whole book. And as I got older, I remember understanding John chapter 1. And John chapter 1, verse 1, is a very important verse of Scripture. Because if you look at other people's Bibles outside of the Christian faith, John chapter 1, verse 1 is different. In John chapter 1, verse 1, follow along your Bible. In the beginning was the Word. Now I capitalized or made it bold on the over screen so you can see that. I want you to see the repetitive word, use of the Word. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. What's, when you capitalize a word in the middle of a sentence, what does that mean? It's the personification. It's the name of a person. So we're not talking about the word like the Bible that you have sitting in your lap. This is the name of a person. In the beginning was the Word. Now notice it's going to define that. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now look at the second verse. It's found in verse 14. And the what? Capital W again. The Word was made what? Who is that? Jesus Christ. And dwelt among us. So the in the beginning was the Word in John chapter 1 is Jesus Christ. And what does it say? He was with God and He what? Was God. Do you know why that's so important? Verse 1 is because they changed that to word was God to the word was a God. You know who does that? Jehovah Witness. New World Translation. They changed that to Jesus was a God. You know why? They do not believe in the preeminence of Jesus Christ. They believe that Jesus was just a prophet like uh, Muhammad and all the other ones. And they're so slick about it. They have these beautiful, colorful magazines and everything. And they even come to your door. You don't have to go them. Everybody does it. Nobody has any problem giving Christ the eminent position. They just don't want to give him the preeminent position. <coughs> Jesus was not just a friend of God. Jesus wasn't just a tag along of God. Jesus is God. If you've grown up in the Christian church, you're yawning right now. Because you already know that. But I'll tell you, these are the seeds that come into a church that are not after you. They're after who you brought with you. Your kids. They want them. They want to change their mind about who Jesus is. And Paul was in prison. He's writing this letter because he knew the danger if they lost The preeminence of Jesus Christ, they lost it all. Who cares if a guy goes to a cross and gives his life if it's not God? There's a lot of people that give their life. Did we not lose a lot of our friends, Larry, and other men in the World War, and ladies that gave their life? But that that doesn't mean that I can be saved. Only Jesus could die that I might be saved. He's not Just Jesus, a friend of God. He is God. In fact, in 1 Timothy, uh, the first letter that he wrote, 1 Timothy 3, chapter 3 and verse 16, is a great verse. You know why I know this verse is great? Even modern Christian translations change this verse. If you have something other than the authorized version with you this morning, a pew Bible or one of those, and you look at it, this verse will be different. Look what it says there, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy. 
If you're married, you, uh, you know what controversy is. That was supposed to be funny. Okay. <laughs> you know what controversy means? Two different opinions. Right? Oh, you guys have never done that? Brenda and I need counseling. <laughs> Amen. Um, but Paul writes on this subject, there's no controversy. What is it? Great is the mystery of godliness. What is the mystery of godliness? Look what it says. Who was manifest in the flesh? God. Who do we know that was born in the flesh? Jesus Christ. Who does this Bible verse say Jesus was? God. Almost every translation has messed with this book or this verse, and they say he was manifest in the flesh. But if you don't know who the he is, you don't know that it's God. Everybody knows Jesus was manifest in the flesh, but not everybody believes that Jesus was God. You see, the supremacy of Christ is at the, at the uh, 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 forefront of everything that we believe and hold dear. He either is God or He isn't. And if He is God, His death meant something. If He isn't, His death meant nothing. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus, when He was talking to His disciples, it was Philip that said to Him, Show us the Father and it will suffice us. Do you know what Jesus... It's in your notes. I printed it in your notes. You know what Jesus said? Have I been so long time with you, Philip, and you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus himself claimed to be the preeminent one. The only one. There are many religions that would have us believe that Jesus merely had God in him. Or they would say that Jesus reveals God or points us to God or represents God. All these statements sound so noble and so nice and flattering, but none of them reflects the truth. The truth is and always has been Jesus is God with skin. <laughs> he manifests in the flesh. Jesus is God with skin. Not only is Jesus fully God, but Jesus is uniquely God. When a person accepts Christ as their Savior, they become a little s son of God. Notice this in John chapter 1, if you're there, still in your Bibles, you don't have to turn far, at verse number 12. John chapter 1, and look at verse number 12. Notice what it says. But as many as received him, that's Jesus, to them gave you power to become the little s sons of God, even to them that what? Believe on his name. We're here today, many of us, I think, all that I can see that I know of personally, we have done that because we've accepted Him as our Savior. We believed in Him when we asked Him to be our Savior. All right? But Jesus is not the best that man can be. He is God. Look again at that verse. And I put a circle. I think it's red. Around the little s. Jesus is not the little s Son of God. He is the capital S, Son of God. He is every bit God. In fact, Jesus is called the only begotten Son five times in the New Testament. You know how you spell Jesus' name? J-E-S-U-S, -S, five. You know how you spell death? D-E-A-T-H, five. You know how you spell mercy? M-E-R-C-Y, five. Five. Five is important. And five times in the New Testament, we are told emphatically that Jesus Christ is the only begotten, capital S, Son of God. You know why I know that's important? Because most of the Bibles, many of the new Bibles out, change that to the one and only, instead of the only begotten. You say, why would someone do that? Because there are a lot of folks that like to give the eminence to Jesus, but they don't want to give the preeminence to Jesus. 
Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. All of us, if we accept Christ our Savior, are sons and daughters of God. Amen? Little s, little d. But there's only one begotten. And if you want to know what that's about, it's Luke chapter 1, verse 35. We're not going to turn there today, but you can jot that down. Jesus physically was begotten by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. He's the only begotten Son of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. That holy thing which is in thee. Luke writes, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee. He's the only one physically begotten by God. You know why that's important? What theological doctrine do we associate with that? It's called the virgin birth. <laughs> Jesus was not born by a man's seed. He was born by God's seed. These things may seem trivial. They may even seem like boring. But these are the bedrock of what we believe. Because if Jesus was begotten by Adam, he'd have the same problem you and I do. And that is that we were conceived in sin. In sin did my mother conceive me. Not that she was a sinner and did something wrong, but we inherited Adam's sin. We're all sinners by birth and sinners by choice and sinners by practice. But Jesus was begotten by God. Never happened before. Never happened since. Mary said, how shall this thing be? I have not known a man. And the Holy Spirit said in Luke 1 verse 35, the Holy Ghost shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing that's in you. Only begotten. When someone changes that in John 1 for 18 and John 1 14 and John 3 16 and John 3 18, when someone changes that, they're after the deity of of Jesus Christ. They want to make him lesser. Than what he is. And may I say it to you again. When you lessen Jesus Christ. You lose any hope. Of eternal life. Because a man cannot give you eternal life. Only God. Can give that. And so I say to you. It's so important. When we talk about the supremacy. Of Jesus Christ. We are not, we will never be the same as Jesus. Never. We're a son of God, but little s. Jesus is the only capital S, son of God. We will forever be the created one. Jesus is the creator. There's no change. And if he is not the creator, God in flesh or with skin, then nothing he did can ever help me or you. It's the supremacy of Christ. One of the things that Paul was trying to say to these Colossians is he said, now listen, there's people coming in. They're telling you a lot of different things. And if they don't tell you that in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily with skin, then they're a liar. They're a liar. Secondly, and we'll do this real quick, the second reality of living in the fullness of Christ is to acknowledge the sufficiency of Christ. Look at verse 10. And ye are complete in Him. Complete in Him. Listen, when, when we have Jesus as our Savior, we do not need anything or anyone else. He is sufficient for our salvation. He's sufficient for our sustenance. He's sufficient for our sanity. <laughs> Amen. The world looks at us and says we're insane. We say, well, I used to be insane. I finally got sane, and you now think I'm insane. Amen. My friends said to me, what in the world happened to you, John? I said, what? <laughs> they said, we liked you the way you were. I said, that's enough. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> I was lost on my way to hell, and you liked me that way. I don't know if I need you as my friend anymore. If you like me better that way. Now I'm on my way to heaven. I've got Jesus in my heart. And I want to live for Him. And you think something's wrong with me? Well, 
praise the Lord, thanks for the testimony. <laughs> you know, I'm glad someone finally put it out there where I can reach hold of it. Uh, so we're sufficient in Him. When as believers we drift into worldly living, and all of us do, or are taken prey by man-made system, always someone trying to teach us the false things, it is usually we're receptive because we feel like we lack something. We lack something. And, and it's been Satan's deceitful lie from the beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 with me. Genesis chapter 3, and look at verse 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to hurry real fast. You guys are always so nice to me. Genesis chapter 3, look at verse 4 and 5. First, I want you to look at verse 1 first. Now the serpent was more what? Subtle. Trick. Deceive. See, that's the whole heart of the thing is someone wants to, to lie to you to get you to believe something that's not true. Satan shows up on the scene. Eve is there. And he begins to talk with Eve. Look at verse 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. God has his plan for you, Satan says to Eve. He said he's going to give you everything. Except, he said, you can't have this tree. I can give you more. He's not going to give you everything. I can give you more. If you think I'm stretching it, look at verse 4. It's a pretty strong statement. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. God said, if you eat that, you're going to die. The serpent said, you won't. I can give you more. God, God don't want you to have everything. I want you to have everything. I can give you more. Satan's trick to Eve is the trick and the trap that he has set for all of us. Give me the next slide there, a slide if you would. I'm kind of trying to go as fast as I can. And that is the devil's lie. They're trying to keep up with me up there, and I'm just I'm I'm running like a racehorse here. The devil's lie is disobedience gets you more. Some of you ladies who don't feel like you have a whole lot to offer the Lord, you know what I'd like for you to do sometime? I doubt that you'll do it. I'd like for you to take some of the teenage girls in our congregation and tell them, don't follow after me. Because you have a compelling story. Don't go the way I went. You have a compelling story. And you could change their life. I'm just pointing over here, but they're all over. The kids. Some of you men have a compelling story. And you could say to our young men here, don't walk my path. Don't follow after me. I didn't do it right. And now I'm suffering the consequences. You don't think you have anything to offer because you can't be as good as Mary Lane in Sunday school or you don't think you can be as good as George in preaching or you don't feel like... You have a compelling story if you would just tell it. And shame keeps us from telling the story. But I'll tell you what, if I can change someone's life revealing my shame, I always want to tell the story. Don't follow me. The only decision I ever made was one that I was stuck. God had me up with his finger in my chest and my face. And he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And this might be the last time you ever get to hear this. And with my back against the wall, I crumbled at his warm embrace. And I accepted Christ my Savior. But everything before that was a total shipwreck. We all have compelling stories. And you know why we have those compelling stories? You know why we did so many things wrong in our life? We always fell for the lie that doing what God tells us not to do will give us more. Somehow or another we have in our mind <laughs> that if we do activities on Sunday morning and not go to church, we're going to get more by doing those activities instead of going to church. I'm just being honest. 
Somehow or another in our mind, we have this idea that if we allocate our income to more things that we can consume for ourselves, that it will give us more than if we give of our resources to the Lord. You say, you're getting too personal. I got one more and then I'm going to run fast, okay? Somehow or another we have in our mind that if we take the principles that we know that are true and we cave on those principles, that what we get as a result will be more than if we stick to our principles. This is the devil's lie. And that's what I mean. We all have compelling stories. We can tell the truth to young people going up. Don't do that. It is not more. It is less. And it's less for the rest of your life. It never goes away. We have a compelling story. If we would just tell it. It's the lie. Of false teachers. This past week. Our boys run cross country for Anna. Uh, Titus and John and they had a banquet and I went to this banquet and Brenda and I were sitting at one table and all the kids were sitting at the next one the guys and the next table was all the girl runners were sitting at that table and uh, in between the shoulders of these two big guys I saw this sweatshirt that one of the girls was wearing and I said I said to John I said hey John who is that he said oh that's Paige I said Paige is yeah And then I connected that through the events that we've been through, I would talk to a lady that was really nice to Brenda and I, and she had mentioned that she had a daughter named Paige. And so I connected the mom who I said to Brenda, I think she's a Christian. I could just tell by the way she she handled herself, her the mom. And so when I saw when when John said that that girl was Paige and I connected with that mom, it was like a light bulb came on. Oh, yeah. And on the back of that sweatshirt, in the midst of all of her peers, were these words, adoption, not abortion. I, I got out of my seat. And I went up to her. And I said, thank you for not being ashamed. And thank you for taking a stand on principles that you learned from God's word. And her eyes welled up with water. And she said, thank you for telling me. If if we're not careful, the deceitful lie of the devil will cause us to cave on everything we hold dear. Because you young men and young ladies, the devil is not at all behind the scenes. He is not uninterested. He is out front and he is in every media outlet you listen to and you read. And it is to say, stop, you shall not surely die. God's God's got it in for you. He's not going to give you everything there is to have. But if you follow me, I'll let you have it all. And it is a lie. It is a lie. To the young people here today, you look at the eyes of all these adults in here. And you see success and joy and confidence. But if you can peer away, peel away that exterior, behind the eyes of everyone in here is regret. And if they could speak to you today, they would say, do not. would say you have less in following Jesus. He is not only supreme, God with skin, but he is sufficient. We don't have time today, but if you look at Psalms 23, I have a beautiful outline at the bottom of your notes to show all the things that we have 
in Christ Jesus, just as recorded in Psalms 23. I would say to you in closing today, when false teachers come around, give me that last slide. If you There's about 16 you have to go through there. There you go. When false teachers come around pawning off their wares, resist their lies by maturing in Christ, walk in Christ, grow in Christ, follow in Christ, live in Christ. When you have everything, you need nothing more. Father, thank You for this day. It's not my intent to hurt anybody's feelings. But it is my intent to be very real. I will take that criticism. Because I care. And in this room, in this blessed building, and in this congregation, there are a lot of young people whose temptation is off the chart to cave on everything they believe and have been taught. I pray that you would keep them safe till the storm passes by. And I pray that you'd help some of us who've already been through that. And in our wake, we have an absolute path of destruction. That we would not be so proud that we wouldn't take the opportunity to say to these young people, the devil's lie is that it is a lie. Don't follow that lie. It always promises more and delivers less. And that we would reject the false teaching of anyone who tries to undermine Jesus being God wrapped in skin or that He is sufficient to every need that I have. And we ask these things in the precious name of that sovereign God, Jesus Christ. Amen. Stand with me if you would this morning. We conclude our song, our hymn, or our service today with this great hymn. It's found in your hymn book if you want 378, only one life to offer. Jesus, my Lord and King, only one tongue to praise Him and of Thy mercy sing. Only one heart's devotion. O Savior, may it be. Here's our prayer. This is our desire consecrated alone to thy matchless glory. Here it is. Yielded fully to thee. Let's sing together. Bless these people, your people. Help us, Lord, to live a mature Christian life. Our roots in the Word of God. Our life bearing the cross for Jesus by telling the story. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks so much for coming.